welcome. This is Dr. Michio Kaku, professor of theoretical physics at the City College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, and this is Exploration. Every week in Exploration, we discuss the fascinating world of science and its impact on society. Well, today we're going to talk about a controversial issue that many scientists don't want to talk about, and that is what happens when scientists create evil. What happens when they collaborate with the Nazis to unleash incredible amounts of destruction, even though they themselves may have had good intentions and some of their work opened up whole new worlds to science? We're going to be talking about two individuals today that shaped the 20th century. The first is Werner von Braun, the greatest rocket scientist of all time, the man who was responsible for putting men on the moon. However, he started off his career working for the Nazis, perfecting the V-2 rocket, the terror rocket, which terrorized London during World War II. He was captured by the Allies and then worked for the United States, building the Apollo space program, which was successful in terms of opening up the world, the universe, for space travel. And in the second hour of exploration, we're going to talk about a much darker side of working for the Nazis. We're going to talk about Fritz Haber, one of the greatest chemists of all time who also worked for the Nazis. However, much of his work was later used for chemical warfare. And it's ironic that the gases that he perfected, including Zyklon gas, was eventually used to gas his own relatives. So in other words, here is the tragic case of a scientist, Fritz Haber, who opened up whole new areas of chemistry. In fact, he made modern fertilizer possible. Think about it. In the old days, nitrogen in the air could not be fixed into chemicals that could be used for fertilizer, even though bacteria can do this. He was able to perfect the process by which we can take nitrogen from the atmosphere and create fertilizer for it. And that, in turn, helped to create the Green Revolution. So on one hand, the German scientist Fritz Haber opened up the modern world of fertilizer, which created the Green Revolution, which greatly expanded the human population, and yet he also worked on poison gases for the Nazis, which were later used to gas his own relatives. So the theme of today's program is scientists who have to take responsibility for the achievements and also the dangers that they unleash on the world. So once again, our first special guest is Michael Neufeld. He's with the National Space and Air Museum of the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C., and he's the author of the book, Von Braun, A Dreamer of Space, Engineer of War. And in the second half of exploration, we're going to bring on Daniel Charles, author of the book, Mastermind, The Rise and Fall of Fritz Haber, the Nobel Laureate who launched the Age of Chemical Warfare. And now I'd like to introduce our special guest for today. We're very delighted to have with us Michael Neufeld. He's the chair of the Space History Division of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. And he's the author of an exciting book. It's a huge book. It's perhaps the definitive biography of one of the pioneers in the exploration of outer space, Werner von Braun. If you are a baby boomer, you probably were mesmerized by the image of this handsome scientist pointing the way to the stars with Walt Disney, saying, on to the moon. And, of course, he was successful that in his lifetime, he saw his childhood dream come true when he was responsible, in part, for putting several men on the moon. So, once again, our special guest is Michael J. Neufeld of the Smithsonian Museum, the book is titled Von Braun, Dreamer of Space, Engineer of War, and it's also a book that forces us to confront the fact that how do we deal with scientists who work closely with the Nazis? So why rocketry? Rockets were thought to be the stuff of science fiction and toys. Uh, why did he seize on rocketry? You know, it was right in the 1920s that uh, that the, 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 the space movement took off for the first time and, and reached the general public. It was because of several uh, theoreticians. One of them was Robert Goddard in the United States. Another was Konstantin Tsiolkovsky in Russia. And then in the German-speaking world, Hermann Obert. And in 1925 or the beginning of 1926, he, he already enthused by astronomy, 
uh, got a hold of Obert's uh, rocket treatise, the rocket in interplanetary space. And even though he couldn't understand it because it was all full of mathematical formulae, he was extremely excited about the idea that you could actually travel there. Okay, now very soon he becomes head of the uh, the uh, rocket program for the government. Exactly how was the transition done? Here we had this young kid getting interested in engineering and rocketry, and all of a sudden he becomes a pro. What happened? Well, it's, it's an interesting thing. Of course, it takes a number of years here, about about six or eight years from the time that he discovers Obert. You know, he, he goes to boarding school. He his math grades, which were terrible, become much better because all of a sudden he's motivated in math and science, and becomes a kind of kind of kind of a prodigy. Uh, he graduates uh, early in 1930 uh, from high school, goes into uh, engineering school in Berlin, and at the same time uh, he was a member of the Early Rocket Society in Germany, and they built a rocket center in Berlin. And this so-called rocket and flute plots, this, this rocket club in Berlin, was beginning to experiment with rockets in, uh, after 1930. And in 1932, the Army, which had already been watching this, got interested again in the rocket as a weapon. The rocket, Maybe the liquid fuel rocket that these clubs were developing might actually be useful for a long-range weapon. Now, 1933 is the pivotal year where Hitler takes over, which changed everything. So how did von Braun deal with the Nazi regime? Well, you know, von Braun at first almost, uh, as he says, uh, paid almost no attention to this uh, change of power, which, except for the fact that his father lost his job, because in fact his father had been the Minister of Agriculture for the for the German Reich in the last two very right wing cabinets before the Nazis came to power, and was for and was out of a job on the day that Hitler became Chancellor. Uh, so the Nazis came to power, and they were very rapidly destroyed the Weimar democratic system and established a dictatorship. But he wasn't that interested in all that, and in any case. You know, pretty rapidly they began funding the army better and better, so more money came towards him and came towards this little rocket program. At that time, just a couple of people, including himself. Okay, and then what happened in the 30s as more and more money came available and which led to the development of the V-1 and the V-2 rockets? Well, in in the 1930s, more money was more and more money was given to rearmament, and there were people in the army, uh, notably General Becker, who became the head of the Army Ordnance Department, who was extremely interested in the long-range weapon uh, and uh, and the rocket, uh, the, what we now call ballistic missile, was an exotic long-range possibility, and so he began putting more and more money into rocket development. That led in 1937 to the founding of a new rocket center at Peenemünde on the Baltic Sea, and von Braun, who'd already built up a, a liquid fuel rocket program, then became the technical director uh, of this of this uh, rocket research station on the Baltic. And how, uh, how old was he when he assumed the head of this rocket program? Um, he, uh, he was 25 years old. He wasn't the head. He was a technical director, mm -hmm. and the head was a military officer always. But he always was the technical head of this rocket development. And he worked for the Army, but the rocket station was actually a collaborative effort between the Air Force and the Army. And he, he was the head of the Army side, which went on to develop what was later called the V-2. That was the ballistic missile. Uh, they called it the A-4. It was the fourth one in their series, which became the weapon deployed at the end of the war. Uh, the V-1 was actually a completely separate weapon that he did not develop. Mm -hmm. That was a cruise missile. It was essentially a small jet airplane, which the Luftwaffe or Air Force developed during World War II. Okay. Now the question is, how did he deal with the Nazi regime? Was he aware that slave labor was used to build these gigantic rockets? Well, he, uh, he was, of course, uh, quite uh, quite aware of what was going on. In 1937, they asked him to join the Nazi Party, so he said, well, okay, why not? In, in 1940, the SS came and pressured him to become an officer, and he asked around, and they said, oh, you know, he said, I couldn't really say no, and that was partly because he didn't really have any strong moral principles other than 
furthering his career and above all going into space is what he really wanted to do. And then in 1943, the problem came up, how are we going to assemble the V-2 uh, and who is going to do it? And there was a real manpower shortage because of the Eastern Front. And so the decision was made by others to use concentration camp labor. And then the last phase of this and the worst of this is that un they went underground in the fall of 1943 because of an air raid on Panamanda by the Royal Air Force. And that's when the really horrible conditions for concentration camp labor uh, set in. And at that time, Von Brown was underground. He saw the concentration camp uh, laborers. He saw the conditions. Uh, he was involved in, in decision-making about using concentration camp prisoners, which means that he certainly couldn't say that he bore no responsibility for it. Okay, now he wasn't the only one in that position. That is, top scientists who work with the Nazi regime, uh, Werner Heisenberg, the man who was in charge of the German atomic bomb program, was in a very similar situation. And so the question is, were these people Nazis at heart? Uh, did they simply join the regime and work the regime because they wanted to further science? Was it uh, careerism? Exactly. Why did they collaborate, in fact, work and head up uh, large parts of the Nazi war machine? Well, in the case of Heisenberg, um, he was never a member of the party. He managed to evade doing that. Uh, I, you know, he was, I think both of them were fundamentally came out of very conservative backgrounds, conservative families that were nationalistic. And therefore, they felt that they were working for Germany and they were working for German interests. Uh, I don't think either Heisenberg or von Braun were fundamentally, uh, believers in national socialism in that way. Uh, von Braun more than Heisenberg, I think, was taken in by the Nazi regime. Was a, was somewhat enthusiastic for Hitler and by, and the conquests and the achievements of the Third Reich as they appeared to be up until they started losing the war. So, uh, of the two, I would rate von Braun as probably being closer to the Nazi regime than Heisenberg and also bearing much more responsibility because in fact Heisenberg never headed up uh, an A-bomb program as such because there never really was an A-bomb program. He was just one of the key scientific leaders of a small scientific group. Von Braun was ahead of thousands of people in the middle of the war. He, he took a major personal responsibility. Okay, now let's talk about the engineering feat. Uh, you mentioned Robert Goddard, who built these little putt-putt rockets. Uh, some call them almost like toys, uh, built on liquid-fueled propulsion systems. And Von Braun takes this little uh, Goddard rocket, uh, only a few feet long, and Bill's uh, Vengeance 2. Uh, Vengeance 2 is the rocket that brought London almost to its knees. So let's talk about the engineering challenges and the successes of yeah. Ron Well, there were, of course, the V2 was an enormous engineering achievement, and I must uh, say that the the, the long-told, off-told story in the United States that he got his technology from Goddard is simply not true. Uh, they, he didn't. He knew very little about what Goddard was doing, and because Goddard was extremely secretive, and in fact, it essentially was an independent line of development that came from Hermann Ober and through the German rocket clubs that led to the development of this liquid fuel rocket technology. And uh, the the main challenges were number one, just building a rocket engine much bigger than anything built before. Number two was the supersonic aerodynamics of a projectile that was going to travel at Mach 4 or 5. And finally, the, the hardest problem was the guidance and control, trying to guide this ballistic missile over a range of about 200 miles and hit something. And, and, and you know, as it turned out, one of its main targets was London, and another was Antwerp after Belgium was, uh, was liberated in the fall of 44. Those two cities were you know, since he shelled by the V2 in the fall of 44 and the first three months of 45. And they did have a local effect of, uh, you know, they were demoralizing in some ways to the local residents. But in terms of effectiveness, I would actually rate them as quite ineffective. Uh, it was much more efficient to use a four-engine bomber to drop plain old gravity bombs than it was to expend the huge resources on the V2 
uh, as a way to convey what was actually only a one-ton high-explosive warhead. And some people say that the V-2 rocket was not guided very well. They simply pointed it and hoped and prayed that its guidance system would place its warhead on the streets of London. Well, in fact, the, the, the V-2 had a very sophisticated guidance system for 1944-45. It was an inertial guidance system using uh, gyroscopic controls, uh, using uh, uh, using a, a tilt uh, mechanism where it goes from vertical over to 45 degrees. And some versions had radio control to try to lessen the dispersion from left to right on the trajectory. But the reality was that the technology just wasn't there. So in spite of all that sophistication, uh, the thing could barely hit a huge urban area like London or Antwerp. Okay, now let's talk about 1945 and 46 with the collapse of the Third Reich. What did Werner von Braun do as Russian and American troops began to converge onto Berlin? Um, you know, von Braun wanted to get away, and in particular he wanted to surrender to the U.S. Army. And when he looked at the options of the Allied powers, it was clear that they wanted to get away from Stalin Soviet Union, and uh, Britain and France did not have the money to fund a big rocket program, and he dreamed still of going into space. Personally, he wanted to travel into space. He wanted to land on the moon, and the United States was his best hope for doing that. So he tried to, to put himself in the path of the U.S. Army. And in fact, uh, he really did, wasn't in his power. It was mostly because of the orders of an SS general who kept moving his group around that he was lucky enough to be in a place that was overrun by the U.S. Army. And indeed, at the beginning of May 45, he surrendered to the U.S. Army. And there's something called Operation Paperclip, in which case uh, Nazi scientists were brought to the United States. So what was the official attitude of the United States toward captured German scientists? Well, it, when, when von Braun surrendered, along with uh, several other key members, including his military commander, General Bromberger, you know, the, the U.S. Army officers and scientists and engineers connected to the U.S. defense uh, became very interested in the possibility of using the German rocketeers in the states, of importing their experience, importing their technology. And it was, a, it was of course, it was not the only group they were interested in. They were interested in all leading scientific and engineering fields that the Nazis had invested in and had some, some advantages in. And so that led to a, you know, a secret program to import German scientists and engineers and technicians into the United States uh, called Project Overcast, which was renamed Project Paperclip in 1946. And Paperclip brought over about a 1,000 engineers, scientists, and technicians, and uh, about one-eighth of those, about 125, were from Brown's group. And also you mentioned in your book the fact that around this time he gets married to a first cousin. Could you elaborate? Right. He was overseas. Uh, it was already overseas in, in the United States since uh, actually September 1945. He was living in uh, Fort Bliss outside of El Paso, Texas, which is where his group was. His 120-some Germans lived for about four years until 1950. And uh, he had had girlfriends before many because he was extremely handsome, uh, extremely charismatic. Uh, he had actually tried to marry somebody in Germany in 1943, and that fell through. And, and, and towards the end of the war, he became very interested in a very beautiful first cousin, uh, Maria von Christorp, uh, and, uh, who was a member of a family he was very close to. Uh, and in 1940, late 46, he wrote to her, and then now that she was 18 and asked her to marry him and they and she felt the same way and so they agreed to engagement by mail and he came over in March 47 guarded by US army MPs the entire time because uh, they were afraid of a Soviet kidnap attempt and he was still somewhat you know watched by us who was he was he loyal was he useful you know so he actually was brought over to Germany and married her in uh, a ceremony in Landshut, Bavaria, in March 1947.
Okay, now let's talk about 47 to 57. Uh, what was happening then? Some people think that America was sleeping while the Russians were soaring ahead with this rockets program. But what was von Braun doing between 47 and 57? Um, well, from, you know, up until 1950, he was uh, heading this small rocket group for the U.S. Army in El Paso, and they launched, they helped to launch the V-2s in White Sands, New Mexico, nearby, um, and uh, they were developing a, a, a cruise missile, actually, which, but they had very little money, because, in fact, we weren't very interested in in the arms race with the Soviet Union until after the Korean War started. And uh, and we did not invest in ballistic missile technology very heavily until 1954, and that was the year the Eisenhower administration sort of launched a crash program to build an ICBM because of the Soviet rocket developments were getting worrisome. They were getting ahead in rocket development. Now, we never quite caught up that advantage that they had built up early on after World War II because in 1957 we were caught by surprise to some extent by the first ICBM that the Soviets launched immediately followed by Sputnik when they launched the first satellite in October 57. Okay, now let's talk about that historic launching of Sputnik. What was the reaction of the Eisenhower administration? What was the reaction of the public when the Russians beat the pants off the United States. Um, the, you know, the Eisenhower administration was was rather calm about the whole thing, which just tended to infuriate uh, many people in the United States even more, because we had advance warning that they would have a rocket and satellite capability, and the Eisenhower administration actually did not mind that they, some in ways, that they set the precedent that you could overfly other countries, because ultimately. Eisenhower is most interested in Florida reconnaissance satellites being able to take pictures of the Soviet Union. But but the public was increasingly fear, infuriated, especially after Sputnik 2 with the dog only one month after Sputnik 1 demonstrated that they had this big rocket, this big launch capability. And so over the fall of 57, the fear over the Soviets beating us got, got heavier and heavier. And uh, that brought the Eisenhower administration under pressure, ultimately accepting that von Braun would be allowed to launch a satellite in addition to our official satellite program, Vanguard. Okay, and let's talk about Vanguard. I mean, here we have the Russians launching Sputnik 1, Sputnik 2, a dog in outer space. Uh, people are hysterical. They're saying that perhaps uh, hydrogen bombs will be raining from outer space. And, and the Vanguard rocket was a dud. Explain the impact of what happens when America's great hope turns out to be a dud. Well, you know, the Vanguard program ultimately succeeded in launching satellites So in 58 and 59, but of course it was an enormous embarrassment on December 6, 1957, when after two Soviet successes, the first Vanguard launch failed miserably on national television, went up four inches, cut off, fell back, and blew up. And so this was essentially the third in a series of humiliations. Uh, and uh, although they then launched a satellite in March 57, in the meantime, when Brown and the Army got their chance, and they launched the first U.S. satellite on January 31st, 1958, Explorer. And tell us a bit about that, because the public impact was absolutely staggering. Here was a German come to America to launch America's Hope, as the press said. You know, by the time that von Braun was uh, uh, famous for launching Explorer, he was already famous for doing other things, notably for writing articles about space travel in Collier's Magazine in the early 50s and for appearing on Disney TV shows in 1955. So he had already made himself into a famous man and had become a U.S. citizen in 1955. So he had an image with the public that many had already accepted that he was probably our leading rocket engineer, leading American rocket engineer. Uh, so, you know, people accepted this pretty well. I mean, obviously there were always people who had questions about his Nazi past, but the Army and, and his own accounts of his past uh, sort of, swept the problems under the rug and only and, and tried to make him look as good as possible. Okay, so what happens after 57? NASA gets formed, a huge amounts of money is available. 
what happens after 57? But, you know, of course, 57 uh, and the Sputnik launches us into a space race. It launches us into a race with the Soviet Union over space, which is continually fueled by, of course, one Soviet first after another. You know, they, 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 the first satellite, the first dog in space, and then later on, the first, the first thing to, uh, go into escape velocity into orbit around the sun, the first thing to hit the moon and so on, and eventually in 1961 the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin. So all of these Russian firsts only fueled this this expansion of American space development. And Finn Brown ends up playing, of course, a very important role in that. His rocket group for the Army is transferred to NASA in 1959-60 and becomes Marshall Space Flight Center. And in the meantime, while this is happening, uh, the Saturn program begins. Its first version of the Saturn, later called Saturn 1, is designed to be a heavy lift vehicle for putting things in orbit. And, of course, ultimately after Yuri Gagarin, Kennedy decides to go to the moon, and Saturn becomes the basis ultimately for the development of the moon rocket, Saturn 5. Okay, now 1961, the Russians put the first man in orbit around the Earth. America once again has another nervous breakdown, and there's enormous pressure, as you mentioned, on Kennedy to stake out the next goal. What was the reaction of the engineers? Did they think that uh, Kennedy was unrealistic by saying that by the end of the decade, we will put men on the moon, or did they think that it was going to be easy? Well, certainly no one thought it was going to be easy to put humans on the moon by the end of the 1960s. I mean, everyone saw that it was an enormous challenge. The reaction varied, actually, depending on who who you were talking to. And I know that many of the people involved with the early Mercury program, they were just hadn't even gotten a human up yet. Alan Shepard was launched about three weeks after Yuri Gagarin for a little 15-minute hop. And then three weeks later, Kennedy announced going to the moon, and they said, my, this is really hard. Uh, Von Braun, on the other hand, having spent his lifetime promoting the idea of space travel and actually having been part of the behind-the-scenes discussions about how to respond uh, with the, you know, Vice President Lyndon Johnson, basically was the one who told Johnson, we can build a rocket to land on the moon probably about as fast as they can. We have a very good chance of beating them to a landing on the moon. And the rest is history. Von Von Braun is successful in terms of putting men on the moon, his childhood dream. However, it continues to haunt him, the fact that he had a Nazi past, the fact that he worked for Adolf Hitler and built the rockets that rained destruction on London. Well, that's it for the first part of Exploration. You've been listening to Michael Neufeld of the Smithsonian Museum, author of the book, Von Braun, Dreamer of Space, Engineer of War. Stay tuned now for the second half when we talk about a chemist who changed the face of humanity, and he built chemical weapons for the Nazis, which were eventually used to gas his relatives. Welcome. Once again, this is Dr. Michio Kaku, Professor of Theoretical Physics at the City College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. And this is the second half of Exploration. The theme of this hour's program is the social responsibility of scientists. What happens when scientists not only pioneer new realms and open up new worlds of science, but also work for governments like the Nazis? In the first half of exploration, uh, we interviewed Michael Neufeld, author of the book, Von Braun, Dreamer of Space, Engineer of War. And in the second part of exploration, we're going to bring on Daniel Charles, author of the book, Mastermind, The Rise and Fall of Fritz Haber, the Nobel Laureate who launched the age of chemical warfare. So here is a man who changed the face of modern chemistry. For example, the Green Revolution, which greatly expanded the population of the Earth, is due to the work of Franz Haber. He showed that nitrogen in the air can be fixed and put into fertilizer. Believe it or not, the modern Green Revolution would be impossible without the work of Fritz Haber. However, he also worked for the Nazis, designing poison gas for the Nazis, which ironically 
were used to gas his own relatives. And so in this half of exploration, we're going to be talking about Fritz Haber, the Nobel laureate who launched the age of chemical warfare, but also helped to create the Green Revolution, which greatly expanded the population of humanity. Okay, let's talk about his childhood. Um, uh, every scientist, of course, goes through a process, usually as a youth, where they get fascinated by the laws of physics, chemistry, and stars. Uh, what was it about his youth that propelled him in that direction? Well, um, there are stories of him concocting chemical experiments, you know, in his boyhood, uh, getting actually thrown out of the house for doing it, but then a, a friendly aunt gave him room, apparently, in her house to conduct these chemical experiments. Mm -hmm. So there was a personal interest, but also Fritz Haber was so much almost eerily a product of his time. And science in general, and chemistry in particular, was the field within which Germany was excelling at the time when he was growing up, the latter part of the 1800s. Um, it was something that Germany, it was an industry that Germany dominated. And, uh, and Haber, I think partly because he wanted, he had this, sense of wanting to escape his his town. He wanted to be an important. He wanted to rise in society. He wanted to be successful. I think partly he latched on to the thing that seemed to be the path toward, toward success. And so he was very ambitious as a youth, right? But he grew up in a Jewish family. So could you explain uh, how his religious identity changed over the years? He did grow up Jewish. He grew up in a large Jewish clan in the city of Breslau. It's now Wrocław in Poland. Uh, he was part of that generation of German Jews who, for the first time, really could participate almost fully in German society. The legal restrictions had, to a large extent, been dropped. Professions were open to them that had never been open to their ancestors. And Fritz Haber just seized on these opportunities with all his might. Um, in his 20s, he converted to uh, Christianity. Um, and this was, to some extent, a rejection of his past, a rejection of his father, uh, with whom he had many conflicts. But it was also a identification with this increasingly powerful in, uh, German state. He wanted to be, he said, much later in life, in trying to explain his decision to convert. He took it as a step toward being more fully German. And uh, what about comparing him a little bit to Einstein? Einstein also came out of that same social milieu. Uh, Jews, as you, as you uh, mentioned, were beginning to be more accepted in German society. Science was the big thing, uh, the meal ticket for a lot of young, ambitious uh, Jewish youth. Einstein was part of that whole movement, but then Einstein began to reject a lot of things associated with the Prussian tradition. But I guess Haber went the other way, right? Right. Einstein and Haber are interesting kind of counterexamples to each other. They were both German Jews, as you mentioned, but Haber rejected that Jewish identity in favor of the German identity. Einstein never liked Germany much. For whatever reason, Einstein just couldn't abide nationalisms of any sort, and particularly German nationalism. He actually renounced his German citizenship as a young man. Uh, so while Haber was renouncing his Jewish identity, Einstein was rejecting his German identity. He was never very religious, Einstein wasn't, but he never, but he always felt almost compelled to stand, you know, with what he called his tribe. Uh, and that included, um, identifying with and supporting uh, the Zionist movement and the establishment of, of the Jewish homeland in Israel. And in fact, Einstein renounced his citizenship as, as a teenager, which is something very rare. Uh, for most teenagers to become uh, stateless. Yeah, unheard of, particularly at that place and that time. And the, the authorities didn't know what to do with him, basically. Right. Well, Einstein, of course, had a very checkered early career. He couldn't get a job. He worked in a patent office. We all hear about these stories of his early days. However, um, Haber was like a meteor in some sense. Could you now trace a little bit his scientific rise? He, he also struggled for a few years after university. He was kind of an outsider. He didn't kind of get on the fast track immediately. But once he did, at the university in Karlsruhe, he just worked tirelessly 
he um, made himself an expert on uh, new fields, it seemed like, every year. And by happenstance, he, he, he got his, his hands on a particular scientific problem that had um, been the subject of much talk, this idea of how to capture nitrogen from the air and convert it into a chemical form that would be useful for fertilizer, the so-called nitrogen fixing problem. And that's how he made his great fame and his fortune. Now, could you elaborate on that? You know, the average person, if you were to mention nitrogen fixing, their eyes sort of glaze over. Exactly. But this is absolutely essential for the prosperity of the human race. We have, uh, what, six and a half billion people on the planet Earth right now. We wouldn't have six and a half billion people on the planet Earth in some sense without the work of Fritz Haber. So explain to us how absolutely essential it is for our, our dinner table. Right. Well, okay, so here's an interesting fact. <laughs> uh, all protein contains nitrogen atoms. All DNA contains nitrogen atoms. Um, today, you know, you look at your dinner plate, you look at your own flesh, and roughly, let's say, half of the nitrogen atoms that are in that food, that are in your body, came from a factory. They came from an ammonia factory using the process, the chemical process that Haber uh, invented. Basically, nitrogen is the fuel that drives intensive agriculture. Wherever fields year after year, or year produce plentiful harvests, farmers are pumping nitrogen into the soil and plants are bringing it back out. Uh, and a lot of that nitrogen ends up wasted, sort of flowing down streams and becoming pollution. But... Um, Around the turn of the century, around 1900, scientists began to glimpse the fact that the world had a limited supply of nitrogen for agriculture, and they wondered what would happen when the nitrate mines in Chile, which is what Europe was relying on for fertilizer, when they ran out. And so they said there's incredible amounts of nitrogen in the air in this form of what they call N2, these tightly bound double atoms of nitrogen. How can we convince those nitrogen atoms to, to, to break apart and link up, say, to hydrogen instead, forming um, NH3, ammonia, which then plants could use, because plants cannot use the nitrogen in the air for food. That was the essential problem, how to capture nitrogen, this limitless supply of nitrogen from the air, convert it into a form that could fuel world food production. Now, as I understand, some bacteria can actually take nitrogen from the air and make it into fertilizer, but that's very limited process. And so we had this bottleneck, uh, the human population. The human population could not grow beyond what we can feed them. And therefore, there was this bottleneck uh, with fertilizer that Haber solved by then taking nitrogen from the air, limitless nitrogen from the air, and making fertilizer out of it. This is right. staggering if you think about it, right? I mean, look right. around. The people you see, your friends, your neighbors, they wouldn't be here. In some sense, they wouldn't be here without Fritz Haber, right? That's right. Well, a lot of things would not would be different. Um, yeah, I mean, particularly in China uh, or, uh, or India or Indonesia, uh, parts of the world that are very heavily populated, that's where humanity would have run into the limits uh, first. North America, we would just eat less meat. <laughs> we could do it without the added nitrogen. Um, but, um, but you know, many, the world would be different without that, that nitrogen uh, fixing, that nitrogen capturing process. The world probably wouldn't have run into those limits until, say, the 60s. They were glimpsed in Haber's time, but um, uh, they weren't really, you know, coming into play until 50 years after his, de after his life. Now, we always hear, hear the stories of struggling artists and uh, poverty-stricken intellectuals, but here was a man who had some financial savvy as well, and he became wealthy. Uh, could you elaborate? Well, Fritz Haber struck a deal with this industrial partner of his, the BASF company, which actually still exists. That, um, he said, um, you know, so we had this patent on this nitrogen uh, fixing process, this ammonia synthesis. Um, for every unit of, uh, of, of ammonia that you make, uh, I, Fritz Haber, the inventor of this, will get a penny or two. And uh, that wouldn't have been so significant had not World War I came along. 
had not World War One come along. But at that point, the German military was cut off from its supply of nitrogen for explosives. And suddenly, Haber's nitrogen-fixing process becomes the key to keeping Germany in the war. And they built enormous factories and produced unbelievable quantities of ammonia. And Fritz Haber was getting money out of every, <laughs> every kilogram of ammonia they produced. He became fabulously wealthy, uh, worth a millionaire many times over. So, in other words, on one hand, uh, he creates a nitrogen process, which in some sense uh, changed the course of agriculture. And then that uh, same chemical genius uh, goes to uh, make uh, weapons of war at, and made him wealthy, right? It turns out, yeah, it turns out that the first really large-scale use of the nitrogen process was for warfare. And what about his Nobel Prize? It's an interesting story there. Immediately after the First World War, when Haber has really become infamous in parts of the world, uh, uh, the Swedish Academy of Sciences awards him the Nobel Prize for this ammonia synthesis. Um, there were great protests in France and uh, snide articles in the New York Times about it. But um, Fritz Haber took it as a, you know, a, a vindication uh, for German science. Okay, now let's talk about Fritz Haber, the man, his political views, his uh, social views. Uh, here was a man who became wealthy, in some sense, on weapons of war. However, he also opened up a whole new area of agriculture, which uh, is continuing to impact the human race even today. Uh, what was in his mind? Uh, what, was it, what was his thinking process? What made him tick? I think, first, there was ambition. Fritz Haber was a driven man. Uh, he really wanted to be important, to be successful, uh, to make a contribution, to be well known, to rise in society. He that he was he was somehow compelled to do that, and you can look for psychological explanations in his uh, escaping his Jewish identity as a as a young man. Uh, he also was a creature of his time. He believed in technical progress. He believed in technology. Uh, and he believed also in his duty to the state. He was a patriot, not in the sense that he, as some Germans were, believe, uh, uh, convinced that Germany was somehow superior culturally to other countries. Fritz Haber wasn't that kind of patriot, but he totally believed in his duty um, to Germany. The state's goals became his own, and when the country went to war, Fritz Haber jumped to the front lines. And what about his fate between wars? Uh, many people, of course, lost fortunes. Uh, Germany was humiliated. Uh, reparations bled the economy. And in some sense, people think the seas of Nazism uh, rose between World War I and World War II. Uh, what happened to his fortunes? Well, Fritz Haber remained a prominent member of German society after the First World War. Uh, he led his institute in Berlin. He did lose a big chunk of his personal fortune, but uh, he retained some as well. So he, he really, for much of this time, uh, was pretty well off. Um, but he, you know, he, again, was tied to his country, and he was distressed by, you know, Germany's misfortunes. Uh, he saw the, the, the rising tide of anti-Semitism, um, and his health, also declined in this area. It's in this era. It's, um, it's it was a difficult time for Fritz Haber. Um, he he tried many things and had sort of the growing sense that uh, maybe things were not working out at all for the best. Okay, and how did what how did he view the gradual rise of Nazism? He died in 1934. However, 1933 is when Hitler rose to the chancellorship of Germany. So what happened now in the late 20s and especially the early 30s where you could see the rise of Nazism? Well, Haber was dead set against the Nazis, uh, partly because he was Jewish and the Nazis uh, were, he knew, his enemies. Uh, but beyond that, I mean, Haber was kind of on the right side during the, the 1920s. He was a Democrat. He participated in um, elections and in a political party that was generally uh, sort of middle of the road, uh, pro-elections. Uh, he had friends among the socialists on, on the left as well. 
So uh, he was distressed by the rise of the, of the Nazis, and when they took power in 1933, he saw in a sense, the writing on the wall. He realized very quickly that, by their definition, he was Jewish. He was not Christian. Um, and when they passed a law saying no Jews can be part of the civil service, Haber was in the position of having to dismiss many uh, members of his own institute. He himself didn't have to resign immediately because he was a World War One veteran, and there was an exemption for that. Uh, but... He uh, did the honorable thing. He tried to protect the most vulnerable in his institute, found positions for them outside the country. Very quickly, though, he'd had enough, and he resigned in protest uh, in the spring of 1933. Spent the, the rest of that year wandering around Europe trying to find a new place for him to live, for himself to live. And what about his friends and associates? Uh, you mentioned in your book that his associate, that uh, helped to also produce that same nitrogen uh, process, tried to help him, but there are limits to what you can do, especially with the rise of Nazism uh, dominating the entire German political scene. Uh, but were there any attempts to help him before he went into exile? Well, sure. Both Max Planck, the, the, the great physicist, and Karl Bosch, um, the industrialist, um, head of the biggest chemical uh, company in Germany, they both went actually to Hitler and and said, you know, you're hurting Germany by forcing these talented German scientists into exile. And in both cases, Hitler, you know, basically wanted nothing to do with, with this. Uh, he, um, according to one account, he said to Max Planck, you know, I'm finished with the Jew Haber. And uh, I read some accounts of that famous meeting between Max Planck, uh, the great founder of the quantum theory, and Adolf Hitler, and Adolf Hitler at one point uh, storms off into a tangent and screams and yells and says, I am not weak. I am not weak. Uh, people say that I am weak, but I am strong. Uh, and at the, after that meeting, uh, Planck said, uh, quote, uh, you cannot reason with men like that. Yeah, yeah. I understand that Max Planck just decided he had to just leave. He just, he just had to leave the meeting. There was nothing to be said. Now, the tragedy is what became of his work, uh, especially on poisons, after he died. How did the Nazis exploit that technology that uh, Fritz Haber unleashed on the world, especially chemical warfare? Well, we haven't talked too much about his work on chemical weapons. Haber really pioneered the use of poison gas on the battlefield. He drove that forward. He recruited troops to attack with poison gas in April of 1915. He also was very interested in the use of poison gas for the, con for the control of insects. Um, he developed techniques for eradicating insects from granaries, from ships, from barracks where, where troops uh, were staying. And in his institute, they developed a particular insecticide uh, for that purpose, and they called it Zyklon. Um, immediately after the war, they improved the formulation some um, and called it Zyklon B. And in the 1920s, that uh, insecticide was was sold across Europe for the control of insects. And after the Second World War started, long after Haber had died, the SS acquired large quantities of that insecticide. Uh, they asked the manufacturers of it to reformulate it somewhat, and they used that poison gas, the, the, the product of Haber's Institute, um, in the death camps to gas millions of human beings. And uh, among those were some of Haber's distant relatives. And let's talk about that. Uh, in some sense, uh, what goes around comes around. Uh, he unleashes chemical warfare on the battlefield, and then it goes all the way around, and then it's used to gas some of his relatives. Uh, do you see some irony there? Oh, it's, it's, it's almost, it, it is macabre. It's, uh, this is one of the, the things about his story um, that makes it almost irresistible for a, for a dramatist. Um, people do things all the time, and it, they, then their accomplishments have unintended consequences. But 
usually for other people. <laughs> mm-hmm. It usually doesn't come back around to yourself. Uh, but in Haber's case, um, he was an instrument of German nationalism in the First World War. He fed the beast that ultimately turned on him and chased him out of Germany. He invented poison gas that was used to kill uh, people to whom he was intimately connected. Uh, it's it's a it's a strange, bizarre, and thought provoking story. Okay, and also I understand his wife committed suicide, uh, perhaps in the realization that uh, her husband unleashed this monster on the world. But uh, what are your thoughts? Well, Clara Immervar was her name, Haber's first wife. She was a chemist herself, uh, very unusual. She was the first woman to receive a doctorate in chemistry from the university in Breslau, where she grew up. She'd been unhappy for years in the marriage, um, but in 1915, a week after the first gas attack, which Haber had organized, Haber came home on leave, and in those few days when he was home, in the middle of the night, Clara Immervar picked up his army-issued pistol, went down to the garden, and killed herself with it. Uh, she didn't leave a note, as far as we know. Other people afterward talked about how she was um, opposed to her husband's work in war, for what you know, we can't know exactly what was going on in that marriage, but for many people, and I think it's a reasonable thought, uh, her suicide stands as a kind of condemnation of Fritz Haber's of Fritz Haber's activities during World War One. Okay, now let's talk about the larger question of science, scientists, war, and social responsibility. On one hand, some people say that perhaps we're too harsh on Fritz Haber because, after all, he died before he realized that his work would be used to gas millions of Jews and communists and Russians and gypsies. But on the other hand, some people would say that he should have been hung as as a war criminal uh, because he willingly unleashed this whole era of, of chemical warfare on the battlefield. So there's a spectrum. Some people say, hang him. Other people say, well, look at the, the social context that they were essentially puppets of governments who funded them. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I have a number of thoughts. and uh, You know, it's interesting to examine the reactions of contemporaries. Uh, there, were, there was a kind of brotherhood of gas warfare that emerged after World War I. Uh, there, some of the leading British figures, scientists in the British chemical war effort after World War I became friends of Haber's, and they actually gave him uh, uh, comfort and uh, a place to land when he got chased out of Germany in 33. Um, I, I sort of, in the reason I wrote the book the way I did, and I think some would probably call it too sympathetic to Fritz Haber, is I think the spirit of Fritz Haber is still very much alive and generally accepted in our society. Uh, Fritz Haber was ambitious, so are many. Fritz Haber was a technocrat, so are many today. Fritz Haber wanted to solve problems. He wanted to help his country. He put his skills and gifts at the service of his nation in peacetime and in wartime, and I think that's what maybe most scientists do today. Now, you can argue, say, oh, well, chemical weapons was a horrible thing. Chemical warfare was simply, as Haber saw it, the cutting edge. It was the new technological frontier. Uh, Twenty years later, that technological frontier, well, 30 years later, the technological frontier was in the area of physics, not chemistry, and we saw the atom bomb. You know, another 50 years, and the technological frontier today is probably, oh, I don't know, computer scientists and, and electrical engineering. But I think this that the spirit of what Fritz Haber did is not all that different from what we can witness today. Well, let's say a few things about Fritz Haber's uh, contemporary, uh, Werner Heisenberg. Uh, he, of course, is one of the founders of quantum mechanics. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle is named after him. Uh, the play Copenhagen uh, won the best play in London and New York concerning whether or not Heisenberg deliberately sabotaged Nazi effort to build the atomic bomb or whether... He was an accomplice to Adolf Hitler's reach for nuclear energy. The play was rather sympathetic and simply said maybe he was just a nationalist. Uh, 
and left open the possibility that he sabotaged Hitler's reach for the atomic bomb. But recently, a letter was released by the family of Niels Bohr, who was Heisenberg's mentor. And in that letter, uh, never mailed uh, from Niels Bohr to his student, uh, Heisenberg, it mentions the fact that you, the student, Heisenberg, wanted to recruit me, uh, Niels Bohr, one of the founders of atomic physics, to work on the Nazi atomic bomb because the Nazi victory was inevitable. And so, since the Nazis were, were going to triumph anyway, why not join the winning side? So here we have a supreme irony. Quantum mechanics, the theory that Heisenberg pioneered, is used every day in modern electronics, computers, lasers, the Internet, satellite communications. Modern society would collapse today without quantum mechanics. We use it in the transistor. We use it in the computers. However, let's be honest about this. Werner Heisenberg also worked on the German atomic bomb. Well, I'm afraid that's it for exploration. Once again, our special guest in the first half was Michael Neufeld, author of the book Von Braun, Dreamer of Space, Engineer of War. The author in the second part of exploration was Daniel Charles, author of the book Mastermind, The Rise and Fall of Fritz Haber, the Nobel laureate who launched the age of chemical warfare. Good day.